Natasha, what an engaging conversation we had this week. We sat down with Holly Andrada, who was the mayor of Lincoln, California. She's currently sitting on the city council. She works at William Jessup University. She's been a teacher for decades. Uh, and I think she's on like 15 different boards, yeah. or both current and active. It was it was enlightening. It was engaging. It was a fantastic conversation. You stole my word. I was not just engaging, but such an enlightening conversation. I have such just huge respect for teachers in general. And I knew coming in that she had had a tenured teaching career, but the way that she talked about her faith and her journey and the way she looks at things and tries to instill that in obviously the children she taught middle school just all around like I left which is one of my favorite parts of the, of the podcast is I left feeling just extremely enlightened and and took away multiple you know tidbits from the conversation yeah I think this is a podcast for everybody I think everybody's going to mm-hmm. be able to take something away and I think you nailed it uh, she was a light um, and not only is she a light but she's a firecracker the amount of energy <laughs> she has is is um, inspiring to say the least. Yes. And she was real too. That's what I love the most is to have just real honest, but positive conversations about even tough things. So it was fantastic. And then she hosted us. We went out to, to William Jessup and got to have a tour and just, she's so open that I, I was honored that she sat with us on the podcast. Welcome to Tell Us Your Story, the podcast that tells the diverse stories of businesses, leaders, and influencers throughout Northern California. Our mission is to ignite inspiration, foster education, and bring our community together. Join us as we unravel the path to achievement, discovering how these remarkable businesses and leaders navigated obstacles, conquered hardships, and transformed failures into success. In this week's episode, we sit down with Holly Andriata. She's the University Advancement Officer at William Jessup University. She's an ordained minister. She's the former mayor of Lincoln, um, California. She's a sitting uh, council member in the city of Lincoln, California. And she's just an overall incredible person. So we always talk about the three um, key points to really hone in on. And there are so many in in this week's conversation, but I'm going to hone in on three. Faith was a big part, not was, is a big part of who Holly is and has shaped her entire life. And we dive into that. We have conversations about it. uh, And I think it's just an incredible conversation that everyone will be able to take something away from. Education is also at the center of of Holly and her universe and the people that she helps um, from the, the younger students that she's helped throughout her career to now working at William Jessup University and helping not just the students, but the overall university uh, is, again, just a really engaging and conversation and something that everybody has something to take away from. And then servant leadership, which is really, really important to both Natasha and I, and I know to a lot of our listeners, and, and taking that approach in the way that you lead and the way that you work and deal with people. So there's something for everybody on this episode. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. So Stay motivated, stay inspired, and sit back and enjoy this episode of Tell Us Your Story. When I was younger, I grew up in, I was in uh, Southern California. We lived in Upland, California, and then my grandfather had a trucking company on my mom's side in Pomona. Um, and we, I lived there till I was about six or seven. And my grandfather and all my aunts and uncles and everybody came to Lincoln I don't know why they picked Lincoln from Southern California. (laughs) And so then we followed shortly after that. And when we moved to Lincoln, I was in the second grade and there were 5,000 people in Lincoln. And you've been there ever since. Well, I've been there ever since for the most part. I grew up in Lincoln all the way through eighth grade. I went, you know, all the way through eighth grade into school there. And I was supposed to go to Lincoln High, but um, my mom and dad made some life choices and moved us to Roseville for a while. So I went to high school in Roseville. And then I went to college and met my husband, and then we lived in Placer County. We lived in the region, and then uh, we lived in Loomis for 11 and a half years with me and my husband and my kids. And then I moved back to Lincoln in, I want to say 2014, 2015. I just felt called back home because even though I wasn't actually geographically living in Lincoln, it's always been my home. It's where my heart is. It's kind of a spiritual thing for me, but 
I was happy to be back. And so I, and I'm not going anywhere. So <laughs> good. Well, we're going to get there. So I, I want to hear about you growing yeah, up. Sure. So how many siblings did you, if, did you have any siblings? I do. I'm the oldest. And then I have a brother in the middle who's three years younger than me. And then I have a sister who's almost nine years younger than me. Mm. And my mom and dad. My dad died five years ago, but mm, there's sorry. three of no thanks. Yeah. Three of us and and how would yeah. you say you guys grew up? So um, lower class, middle class, as far as socioeconomic. I think that in the early years we were probably. I wouldn't say we were like in poverty, but I most of the time we were probably lower middle class. Um, and then as my dad's business took off, you know, later in life, um, it was better, more just regular middle class. We've never been wealthy, never been, you know, at the upper echelons of the economy, um, but never went without. You know, God always took care of us. God always provided for us. And so in my childhood, I grew up in the church. Um, currently, right now, I'm an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God. So I've been a Christian my whole life. And uh, so... Uh, that's one thing I can thank my parents for that raising us up in church. Yeah, I, I was mm-hmm. raised in the Christian and Protestant as well. Yeah. Um, did you know that you weren't um, well to do like growing up? Did you know the difference or like I, I hear a lot of time people say I, I was poor, but I didn't know I was happy. Yeah. Well, when I was younger, living in Lincoln, everybody that I knew, except for a few exceptions, we were all the same. Right. There wasn't really any difference. When I moved to Roseville, uh, I could tell the difference because we lived in one part of town um, that was, it was not a bad part of town. It wasn't like the ghetto or anything like that. It was nice enough. But when you go down a couple of miles towards the high school, all the more well-off families. And then I went to Oakmont High School before Granite mm. Bay High School existed. So all those kids came to Oakmont and there was a definite um difference Difference. between (laughs) my economic status and their economic status but i never really let it bother me like i it it was no big deal like i said i always had clothes my parents fed us and took good care of us and that's all that matters yeah but i but there was a definite difference like i could tell and your your dad you said owned owned a business is that and what did your mom work well so in the early years my mom worked for my grandfather in his trucking company and my dad drove trucks for him my dad and all my uncles drove trucks for for many Mm -hmm. years and then when they moved out of that my mom went to work for a few years in the insurance field and my dad my dad learned um the heating and air hvac trade from his uncle and so he started working in that field and then eventually opened his own business and he did that for several years Mm and when by the time i started having kids my mom kind of retired so she could stay home and help raise the grandkids and stuff so what were you what were you like growing up maybe with your siblings or just in school what type of you know child were you I would say that being the only child in in the dynamic of my family, I was very responsible. And I knew how to laugh. I knew how to have a good time. But I took things seriously a lot of times. My mom and dad joke that when I was very young, we had someplace to be the next day. I had some kind of school event that I did not want to be late for. And I kept asking them about the alarm clock. And finally, I said, maybe I should just keep the alarm clock with me. And I was like five, right? And they... (laughs) Thought that was just the most hilarious thing, but I was very responsible, very conscientious about things. Not that I never made a mistake. I was a kid, right? But, um, and then in school growing up, I always, you know, tried really hard. I, when I was younger, I was a, a people pleaser. Mm-hmm. I would, did not want teachers to be upset with me. I didn't want anybody to be mad at me. I wanted everybody to like me. If I had one person in my class that was not like my best friend that loved me, I would cry and tell my mom that I had no friends, oh. you know, <laughs> that kind of That's thing. Very she would yeah. talk to the teacher and the teacher was like, what are you talking about? Holly, we love Holly. She's got lots of friends, oh. you know, but I was very sensitive as yeah. a child. And so... You know, in high school, I was a decent student. When I went to college, I worked even harder. You know, mm. I, was, I was never at the top of my class until grad school. But um, I just, you know, I I know how to have fun. But I've always been very serious, very a uh, rule follower. I was very, I was a rule uh, follower. Like, I was afraid to get in trouble, you know. Sounds and, just like me. Well, and <laughs> what's <laughs> funny about it is, you know, you do all these studies and you, and you read things about birth order. And, like, my siblings and I send each other memes and videos. And we're on this kick now of, like, oldest, middle, youngest child. And these things are hilarious. But, like, it's us to a T. I'm just yeah. like. <laughs> and my sister finally says, okay, leave me alone. You know? 
Because uh, so she was the baby and she got away with everything. And yeah. I got away with nothing, you know. I'm a so. middle, so we're left yes. out in that yes. whole nine, you know. <laughs> yes. so, yeah. um, so what about high school? What did that look like? You referenced going to college. So aspirations. Mm. What were, you know, in high school, what was kind of the plan? High school, was, high school was fine. It was a little rough for me because... I was set to go to Lincoln High School. That's where all my friends were. That was my home. I got thrust into this new environment. And to your question earlier, you know, not in the the wealthier status of kids, and they all had gone to school together. And so I did find friends, and I did have my little niche. But I so I had friends there, but it wasn't as um, fulfilling as it would have been if I had stayed at Lincoln because. I didn't have the confidence to like play sports or do different Mm. things. I did some things. If I had been at Lincoln, I think that my life would have been different in high school. But then, you know, I sit back and I think, well, God orders our steps and he knows what's going on. Right. So I just look at the experiences I had in both places and Mm -hmm. I high school was great. And so when I graduated, I went to American River Junior College because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And again, what was your dream when you were going? Well, that's the thing. I didn't really have a dream then. Mm-hmm. I had always been um, drawn to kids and teaching and leadership roles, but I didn't really have a dream because I didn't know what I could do, and I really didn't have confidence in myself that I could do anything great. Mm-hmm. I knew that I wanted to go to Bible college, and so... I went to junior college for a couple of years to get some of the, you know, general stuff out of the way. And then I went to Bethany Bible College, which is in, uh, it was in Santa Cruz or Scotts Valley, California. Uh, so a question for yeah. you. It's super interesting. So your faith has been there since, mm-hmm. from your parents, since the time you were. Mm-hmm. So a lot, a lot of individuals, their faith as they graduate high school, they, mm-hmm. they separate, right? When mm-hmm. Mom and dad so mm-hmm. this is the way it's going to be. And then they come back. So mm-hmm. you didn't waver from it. It sounds like it's always been constant. No, you know what? Just like any um, young person growing up in high school, I had my moments where I wasn't as devout or I might have done things with mm-hmm. kids that I shouldn't have, you know, you know, partying or whatever. I mean, I wasn't a big Being party. A kid, I was not a partier by <laughs> any means, but just, you know. Yeah. I, I, you know, we have those moments where when you're a teenager, but no, I never departed from it. And uh, let me back up just a second. When I was in American River Junior College, I, again, I took all these different classes. I thought about being a social worker. I thought about being a preschool teacher. I thought about all these different things. And the counselor said to me one day, Holly, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I was thinking about being a teacher's assistant. And he just looked at me and I told my husband this just not long ago. I was reminiscing. I said, I don't even remember this guy's name. I couldn't tell you what he looked like. But I remember what he said to me. He said, Holly, why don't you just go for the whole ball of wax and become a teacher? And I said, okay. (laughs) And I did. And so that's what I did when I went to Bible college. I I took all the Bible units, but I went for my teaching credential. And so I became a teacher. So I love it. So we talk a lot on this podcast and people talk about their mentors and it doesn't sound like it was a mentor, but he was in a position of authority Mm -hmm. and he could have sent you down any direction. He gave you a positive, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and support and you hold on to it all these years later, which I always tell my kids is like the words that you use are powerful. And when you speak to people, they're going to remember it one way or or the other. And so um, that's a good story. It's a great story that he put you down that path. Right. And I think that the Lord used that moment to give me confidence of like, well, I've been kind of doing this. I can do that. I can be a teacher. And so I knew from that moment I wanted to teach older kids. I didn't want to do elementary level. So I've always been kind of drawn to the middle school age. And I did some high school through my career, but mostly middle school. And what what was it about that? So my daughter-in-law, so she's also a high school teacher, but Mm -hmm. she's with um, the the challenged children, Mm -hmm. severely challenged children. So, and I asked her the same question. So everyone has their why. What what was your why to pick that age group? (laughs) To be really honest with you, knowing myself how I do, I love little kids, but teaching them all day they're very needy right and it's like hanging on you all the time I'm like I don't know if I can handle that and I also know that part of my charm as you would say is (laughs) I can be very sarcastic and I knew with older kids that I could um, have a relationship with them through humor and sarcasm Mm -hmm. and kind of like a more of a bite I can't do that with little kids. Yeah. That that would make them cry, and I can't. I wouldn't want to do that. Right? I love little kids. What was that? How so old were you when you made that decision? 
I was um, 19 or 20. That's very yeah. insightful for a 19, yeah. 20 year old. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And so and it, that actually came to pass because when I teach in middle school for all these years and some high school, you know, I could say things to them that would shock them and get their attention and make yeah. them be quiet and sit down and focus or whatever. Or we would have a good laugh about it, but they got the point. Or just in, the best in teaching. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and I loved my kids and they loved me, right? But I could say things to them like, I won't repeat it now because <laughs> <laughs> on a podcast, it might not come across the way it was lovingly <laughs> said to moment, them yeah. in the moment, right? Um, but I could say things that were a little bit more sarcastic or kind of make fun of them a little bit in a loving way. They're like, okay, okay, you know. And I, I just knew that about myself. And so it, it served me well for a lot of years. Yeah. I oh. mean, middle school, that's that's also a rough. A middle rough school is rough life. because they are they are growing and changing and they want to be older and cool, but in a lot of ways they're so still so immature <laughs> and they don't really know they're they're like trying to figure themselves out. Yeah. And so sometimes they're super sweet and sometimes they come in and they just got attitude for days, you oh. know, and you're just like, okay. <laughs> You know, so they're they're That's, kind of because they're going through all those changes. It's a rough age, but they're precious. It's a precious age. Yeah. Uh, so as you're going through college, so you go two years American River, and are you dating at this time or staying single? Um, you know what, I was dating at that time. I I you know I've had a few boyfriends over the years. Um, and then when I but when I left American River and I went to Bethany, I decided that I wasn't going to date anybody for a while. And that didn't last very long, but <laughs> nothing too serious until I, I started dating my husband our senior year. Ah, okay. So let's he take, went to college with you. Yeah. So let's take a minute. How did you meet him? What the paint the picture for us? So okay. Know. So, um, let me guess. I mean, he, he walked into the room and you just fell instantly in love. Actually, it was the other way around. <laughs> yeah. No, no. My husband actually grew up in Marysville in the Linda Oliver's area. And um, he's three years older than me, but he started school a little bit later. He was working and doing everything. So we were in the same class. I came in as a junior uh, and he was a junior and he was in the leadership. And the leadership rule at Bi in our Bible college was if you're in leadership and you're doing, you know, student orientation and things like that, you cannot be scamming on the new girls and you can't date anybody, you know. And he said he noticed me right away. He saw my name on the list. And when I came through, he knew who I was. He, he really liked me, but he couldn't ask me out. Mm. And yeah, that was our junior year. So we were just kind of friends, right? Kind of getting to know each other. And then I had, um, you know, I dated other people and then, you know, those didn't work out. And then our senior year, um, we, we started talking more. And um, what's funny is we joke all the time because we had a, a mutual friend. My husband was going to ask me out and the mutual friend comes in the dorm and goes, oh, I'm thinking about asking Holly out. And oh. so my husband didn't ask me out because, you know, the bro code. And I'm like, that's <laughs> dumb, right? So that waited a while, and then when that relationship fizzled out, then my husband asked me out, and uh, we we only we only actually dated for a few weeks before we got engaged. Oh, oh my! And how gosh. long have you been married wow. now? Almost thirty three years. Oh, congratulations! Thanks. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. And we have four grown kids: twenty nine, twenty eight, twenty seven, and twenty one. Oh, oh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So for those who can't see, you're beaming. Yeah. Right? You're beaming. <laughs> My kids are great, yeah. Uh, so as you're you're going through college, you're, you know what you want to do now. So mm -hmm. what does it look like as you get out of college? What's your first job look like? My first job was... Uh, well, my husband and I subbed a lot in Marysville District because he was he was actually decided he was going to be a teacher too. He had a different path, and then he decided he would do that. So he started the credential program. We were both subbing and working other jobs because we were newly married. You know, broke as a joke, and you know, <laughs> um, just trying to you know figure out what we want to do. And then I did get a job eventually at a Christian school in the area, and I did that for a little while. And then I eventually got pregnant with our first child and that job was really stressful. So I just decided just to take a little bit of time. Um, but in the meantime, so we were kind of on these two different tracks. We're both in the education. And so I started out in Christian private school and then I went to public school later. Um, he started out in Christian private school and then went to public school later. But at the same time, ever since we've been married, we've been doing ministry together. So after a few years, because we both went to Bible school, we had the Bible units and the credent and the qualifications. We we got our official minister's license with the Assemblies of God. So we were doing ministry in church together. We weren't paid pastors or anything like that. We were pastors, but we were a lot of it was volunteer or doing different things. And it's been different over the years. We've done lots of different things, but we're te teaching full time in the day and and doing ministry 
and other times. And so and, I have a question there. Um, so do you see the two paths very similar in teaching and ministering? Like they, they're, like, are do you see them similar? I do because both of them are callings. Hmm. You know, people go into people don't go into education for the money. Yeah. You, you talk about economic status. My husband and I joke all the time about we have friends who are realtors or, you know, technology, whatever, different fields, and they're just rolling it, right? And he and I are in ministry and in education, and and we're fine. Like, God has always taken care of us. We're not poor by any means. Like, I'm not complaining, but we just kind of chuckle and we're like, we've always been in the wrong business, you know, because, <laughs> you know, just the lifestyle, well, right? better be a calling. <laughs> so it's a calling, right? Education is a calling. You cannot devote that many years of your life in the classroom a lot of times, you know, you hear people say, oh, you get the summers off and what an easy job. They have no idea. They yeah. have no idea oh, what it's like it. to be in a classroom with 30, 35 kids. You're responsible for them. They're, they're learning for their well-being. You have kids from all different backgrounds, all different learning styles. Some have disabilities. It's it's a tough job, but it's a very rewarding job. There's a lot of great moments in there. So it's a calling. Ministry is a calling, too. I guess there's some people who have gone into ministry as a job, right? It's a way to make a paycheck, but it's also a very challenging profession. Being a pastor, being a minister, preaching the gospel, trying to reach people for Jesus and live out that life of faith, you know, people are messy and it's hard. And if you're not called to that, then you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So along those lines, um, as you've, so my mom was also in the ministry as well. So she would go to juvenile hall and she would teach classes. So I grew up in That's awesome. that environment. Uh, so this is kind of where the question comes from. As you've gone down that path, there, there has to have been times where you were disappointed or you questioned, I would imagine, like, man, I've put all my effort into this individual or whatever and mm-hmm. just didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Like, how did, how did you, how do you, how do you deal with that? And because you're a, taking it all on. You're that's taking a really on. good question. What I would say is being in ministry and you see, for lack of a better term, my husband always says how the sausage is made, right? When you're in leadership and you're running a church, stuff happens and people get hurt. You know, leaders get hurt. Sometimes you feel betrayed by people that, like you said, you've poured everything into them. You've loved them. You've mentored them. And then they stab you in the back or other leaders for whatever reason, you know, they allow the enemy to come in and use them as a tool and they betray you. There have been moments over the years where I have said to God, why am I doing this? You know, Mm -hmm. Um, but the bottom line is that God called me to it. And, and he, he says to keep our eyes on him and he will take care of it all. He will take care of me. He will heal me. He will direct me. He'll deal with whoever has done me wrong. My job is to forgive and to give grace. Now that doesn't mean that if you're in a toxic relationship that you have to keep going back to that, yeah. right? But yeah. there's there's a very a lot of freedom and forgiveness and and grace. And God has there have been multiple times where my husband and I have said, okay, well, you know, what are we doing now? And yeah. the Lord just says, keep going. And um we just have to give it to him. We have to let him take care of it. Uh, because like I said, ministry is hard. And and if I focus on what this person did to me or that person did to me, then life is miserable, right? So yeah, I so just trust him with it. A little bit of a rabbit hole, but I'm I'm fascinated. I always I always get curious on this question. So with that, when you're going from your twenties into your thirties into your forties, right? Experience changes who we are. Mm-hmm. So um did some of those lessons callous you in, in the way that you would, you know engage with people and say, I'm not going to get burned this time. I'm going to be more cautious. No, actually. Well, it gave me wisdom on like who to trust and not to trust. Right. Like sometimes I I found myself when I was younger that I trusted certain people too much, you know, and that came back to bite me. And so it was a learning lesson, but your question is really um, important because what I tell people is that it didn't callous me. What it did is it built my armor because what God is having me do today with um, city government and and what I'm doing at, at the university and other things that he's called me to do, which we'll talk about in a minute. But mm-hmm. 
I, when I was 20 and 30, I could not be doing what I'm doing. I wasn't ready for it. And with every trial, with every wound, with every betrayal, with every hardship, with every financial crisis that my husband and I have gone through and we had to just trust God, every thing that happened to our kids, because growing, growing kids is hard too. Like we raised four amazing human beings, but parenting is not for the faint of heart, right? <laughs> with everything that we, what I have been through, what we have been through, that God has brought us through, he built my armor, and not, not in a callous way, but... Um, that where I can stand up and do what he's called me to do today because I wasn't ready then, but I am in a different place now. So it didn't callous me. It prepared me. Yeah, I love it too. It's, um, you know, advice I give to people I mentor or my kids, right? Like sometimes whether it's ministry or you're, you're looking at a corporate promotion or you want a a particular position and someone says you're not ready and Mm -hmm. you're so frustrated, Mm -hmm. but they have the wisdom to say you, you need to go through some of these mistakes and you need to build up this Mm -hmm. um, armor so that you know how to handle these situations or it's going to impact other people around you. You won't be equipped for it. So I love, I love it. Um, And I took us down a little bit of a rabbit hole, but (laughs) um, coming back to um, those jobs. So Mm -hmm. going into um, your thirties and you're raising a family. Um, cause I want to get to what you're doing now. I just want to mm-hmm. kind of go through that journey. Um, when did you make the transition from private to public? Uh, probably around 2004, or 2005, my kids were all in a private Christian school and my husband and I were on staff at the church and I taught in that school for three years and I was the principal for a year and then some things changed there. And so we left there and we, that's when we moved to Loomis. Uh, we were, living in a different town. We moved to Loomis and um, my kids started public school. And that was a big leap for us because they had been in Christian school Mm -hmm. and my oldest was going into the fifth grade at that point. And so the kids were all staggered pretty close together. And so we made the decision, we'll put them in public school. And then I started subbing and teaching in that school district. So I was around a lot. And they stayed in public school ever since. Uh, so that transition for you as you're teaching. So I remember going to Bible study on Wednesday, mm-hmm. church on Sunday, mm-hmm. and then I go to church on Monday. And it was a different crowd. It was um, completely different. So you're going from teaching in a private Christian where, you know, everybody's aligned with mm-hmm. the, you know, where the heart is supposed to be and what you're, you would like to think everybody's aligned. And then you go to public school where it can be any number of religions and, and no religion. Right. What was that transition like? Was it a shock or were you prepared for it? You knew it was- No, it wasn't a shock. No, I, I was prepared for it because just growing up in the world, everyone's different, right? <clears throat> Not everybody thinks the same way you do. What I did and what my husband does, he teaches high school and he has for many, many years. What I, the way I approached it was there are things I know that I can't say and things I can say, right? Like I'm not going to get up and preach in my class because it's a public school, Mm -hmm. but I can be a good example for them. I can teach them what it means to be honorable and have integrity and trustworthy and to be a good student. And then in my subject area, because I taught history and government and social studies, when we talked about world religions or we talked about the constitution or the founding of America, I found ways to bring in um, faith without crossing the line or preaching at them. And a lot of times the kids had many questions and they want to hear about it. And then when I was time to teach about Islam or the other ones, I, I taught them the facts. Right. So there's a lot of opportunities to share things with students and the people around us without, you know, getting on your pulpit and crossing the line in a public setting. Yeah, so when um, when you think about 2005 to 2024, I see just a massive change in you know our culture mm-hmm. um, and students, young, you know the youth. And I would imagine that my parents said the same thing as I came, and before them, they mm-hmm. said the same thing. So I'm aging myself here. But wait, you said in 2004, 2005. Well, that's when she went, that she started teaching in public school oh. to now, to 2024. My oh, question that's what is I was that's what, yeah. the difference, like mm-hmm. um, a drastic difference, do you think? Like massive difference in the past 20 years? Yes, I think the massive change came right around COVID and coming through COVID, maybe a little bit before that. <clears throat> so I started teaching at Cooley Middle School in Roseville in 2008. So I was teaching in Loomis. I got hired full time at Cooley and I was teaching eighth grade. And for the first several years, um, 
I could teach. What I would do is here are the facts. Here's this side. Here's this side. Think for yourself. You know, if you're going to do a current event for me, I want you to pull your sources from both sides of, you know, right wing, left wing, middle, whatever. And then you you tell us what you think is actually going on in here in this story. And I could teach them that way. I could um, share information with them. I was always very careful not to push my own political views or, or opinions on them, but they'd ask me questions and I would give them honest answers, right? For many years, parents would like love it. They would hear things. They would say, thank you for that. You know, really appreciate that. I would give a speech to my graduating eighth graders every year about choices that they made in high school. And, you know, I got pretty serious with them and parents would come back and go, thank you for sharing that. Like, and so for a lot of years, it was really good. Um, and in fact, to your point earlier about teaching in, you know, public school versus private Christian school, I never made a, a secret of who I am and what I stand for. And at Cooley, my second year there, I started the, a Christian club for students. Mm. And before COVID, it was the largest club on campus. We had about 200 kids in the gym wow. on a Wednesday at lunchtime. And I had different youth pastors come in and help sponsor and they'd give the kids pizza and donuts and they would talk about the Lord and just teach them how to be good people. And so everybody knew who I was and yeah. people would, you know, come to me and ask me to pray for them or I was able to share, you know, encouragement mm -hmm. with people. So you can be who you are. You don't have to hide that. God gives you wisdom how to share and what to share, when to share, right? Um, and so, but when we, right before COVID, I think probably a couple of years before that, and then that whole scenario was very challenging there started to be a shift in parents. Mm -hmm. I would I would give a lesson to students and I would explain, let's just take illegal immigration, for example, right? We would talk mm -hmm. about the Constitution and how the country's made up and, you know, presidents and policies and that sort of thing. And so they were asking about stuff. And so I was, okay, well, let's talk about that. And I made a comment about if we don't vet who comes into our country, right? Sometimes bad people come in. Yeah. You know, sometimes they're criminals or they're this or that. Yeah. I get a parent irate, yelling at me, telling the principal that I said all illegal immigrants are rapists and murderers. Mm. And I looked at that parent. I said, 100 percent did not say that. Mm. I'll tell you exactly what I said. And that scenario played over and over and over again, where I would have conversations mm. with kids. They would ask questions. I would say, here's the facts on this side, on this side. Like, what do you think about it? And parents just would have a fit. And and then I, I got tired of defending myself. I'm like, I didn't say that. This is what I said. Yeah. Well, my student wouldn't make it up. Well, I hate to tell you about your kids in the eighth grade and their brain isn't fully yeah. formed and they don't always hear everything right. Or anyway, I laugh, but I was like, so there was a definite shift and it got harder and harder to, to teach my subject because I'm not the kind of teacher that can just say open up page 24 and do these five questions and then you're done like i like to have conversations i like to teach them i would go to great lengths to teach them the backstories about different presidents or leaders or things that happened that weren't in your textbooks i would do a lot of research mm -hmm. and share interesting facts with them have them do interesting projects and we talked about a lot of stuff i can't stifle myself and just to be like you know yeah okay here do this worksheet and then we're done and that was very hard for me. So there's a lot. I think the the school system in general is kind of a hot topic of like, you know, especially in our country versus other countries and all of that. Um, we don't have to go like super far into it. But do you think that those it sounds like there's like this, the system and process and ways of teaching. And then there's the actual people that you put in the right, the parents and the mm -hmm. children. And so um, just any thoughts on that as far as it. Um, I mean, is I guess, is it who's in it that makes it hard or is it, you know, truly the system, do you think? Well, I think the system is broken. It need, our, our public education system is definitely broken. It's okay to have difference of opinions, but what's happening now is one side is squashing out the other opinion. Like you can't have any kind of opinion, you can't have any disagreement or you're labeled as a hater or a racist or a bigot. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. Yeah. Teachers unions are a big problem because all this money, I, I was in the belly of the beast. I saw it up close and personal. There's nothing that they do that is for the classroom. It's all political activism and it's all on one side. It's fine if you want to have that opinion or live that way, but you're taking people's, you know, union dues and it's all political activism. They talk about education, but it's not about the students. So that's a problem. Yeah. Right? The other thing is, 
the shift in society of raising responsible young people. We, you know, you used to hear people talk about um, helicopter parents, you know, hovering over your kids, make sure they, nothing hurt them. Everything's fine. We graduated from that to bulldozer parents. You bulldoze any obstacle in front of your child. That means teachers. That means responsibility. That means accountability. Today's parents, not all of them, we still have some good ones, but in the public education system, there's too many parents who blame the teacher for everything. Their mm-hmm. student never does anything wrong. They're not held accountable. Um, you need to accept all late work. Doesn't matter how bad it is. Uh, it's okay if they're on their phone in class. You have bulldozer parents who want to bulldoze every obstacle that is in front of their children, and you're and they're crippling their kids. I was gonna say they're also mm-hmm. crippling the teachers. They I, are. They're exhausted. Yeah, they're I would imagine they don't want to do. It. I would imagine. You probably have an exodus of teachers when they have an opportunity because they're done dealing with it. We have a shortage of teachers, right? Yeah. And then the other thing that happened when COVID happened and schools shut down, that was damaging to kids and families. They lost a lot of learning and they lost how to they lost the knowledge of how to be a student. And then when we came back, everybody was in masks. And I'm not debating whether masks work or not, but when you cover my face and their face. Do you know that 90% of communication is nonverbal? And a lot of ways that we connect, especially with middle school, is our facial expressions and how we interact with each other. And so what happened is you're wearing a mask, so it's covering your nose and your face. All you can see is eyes. The next thing we know, kids have their hoodies on. I know the podcast can't see me, but picture this. Yeah. You got a mask over your nose and your mouth. Then they got their hoodie on and they cinch it tight and so you can barely even see their eyes because they're hiding. The cases of anxiety and depression and confusion in our in our middle schoolers and high schoolers skyrocketed. Suicides. Sky- I had three separate former students commit suicide mm. during that COVID oh period. Oh, my God. Yes. And so, yeah, we needed to eradicate the disease, but the cure was worse than the disease. Yeah. And and my husband is still living it today. Schools are open. They've been up in Placer County was the first to open schools. We fought really hard to get our kids back. But kids are still uh, behavior is through the roof. Like there's no accountability. There's no I mean, the schools are trying. Right. But yeah. the, the behavior is is out of control. The disrespect to teachers is out of control because kids have lost. Kids are lost. Mm-hmm. They've lost themselves. It, and we got to find a way to get them back. I agree. And it's, it's not just the youth. You can go into the young adults into the 20s, 22, 23. Uh, and that were in that covid environment that went into went homeschooled for the last two, three years, or maybe in the last couple of years of college, and now you put them in a corporate setting where you need to come in and give a presentation and look at like They're relearning how to mm-hmm. engage yeah. into society, and it's you can visibly mm-hmm. see it. Right. Yeah. That's, that's true. And so in my journey, um, I started feeling restless where I was at, and I just started praying about it. I really wanted to teach... I teach college level. I had gotten my master's and I'm about to get my doctorate. I'm almost done. I'll be done wow. in the spring. Um, and so I wanted to teach at a higher level, but I wanted to do something different to make a difference for what's happening in our with our kids today. So at the end of 2022, I left school. I, I quit. I resigned. And it was a year-long process of just confirmations, right? Okay, this is the right thing. I'm With another job it. ahead of you? or Nope. I, oh. I was mayor of Lincoln at that time, and we can talk about my election. Yeah, I want to come back to that in a minute. So, <laughs> on the side, just mayor <laughs> on the side. <laughs> that I was mayor of Lincoln at that in, the, in 2022, and I really wanted to finish the year strong. I wanted to be a good mayor. I wanted to be available. So at the end of the school year, I resigned, and my husband and I had saved enough and done some things to where I had basically a year before I had to actually get another job. And so I had a little bit of time off, Mm -hmm. and so I was able to do that. And we can talk about getting another job when you're ready to ask that question. So let's go back to, (laughs) because I'm going to come back. So one, congratulations, and Mm -hmm. uh, on... We're going to figure out where you got to, but taking that year off and, yep. and you were such a faithful person. So you have, you know, faith. Mm-hmm. Not everyone has the same faith mm-hmm. um, to say, hey, I'm going to go chase mm-hmm. whatever that dream or that passion is. I'm going to take a year off and figure it out. Let's go back to 
um, how you got into politics. Okay. So mm-hmm. I, I will say, you know, the themes come up as we have conversations. So faith is clearly a theme with you, as is leadership and giving back. Those are the things that are standing out mm-hmm. to me. Like, you just can't deny it in your presence. Um, so how did you get into politics and why in the world would you get into <clears throat> politics? Like, yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> So back, I don't even remember the year. We were still living in Loomis. My kids were younger, and I think maybe the oldest was in high school by then. I'm not really sure. I was teaching at Cooley, and I was teaching eighth grade U.S. history in the government, and I love teaching the Constitution and talking about elections and how our government is made, you know, the Senate and the House and all that. And so I was interested in that already. And it was election season, and one of our California senators at the time was running for re-election, and I was listening to the radio as I was getting dressed, and I heard her say something that just really, like, annoyed me. And I just, I can't even explain it. I just had this, like, fire in my belly that I was like, I want to run for office. So I texted my husband, and I said, Whoa. I want to run for Senate against so-and-so. Oh, so you were going big. Well. <laughs> you were yeah. starting the local. I well, that you- was just the thought. <laughs> and, and my husband's response was, that's great, babe, but we don't have $20 million for you to run for Senate. <laughs> Good point. So I put that on the back burner. And we were still raising kids. And, you know, some of them were going through some hard times. So the, I just kind of put that on the back. So fast forward a few years later, we, we had moved back to Lincoln. And let me just say again that Lincoln has always really been my home. I love it. Um, I'm very concerned about the things and it had grown a lot. Like I told you, when I moved there, there was 5,000 people there and now we have close to 51, 52,000. And so there was a lot of changes and a lot of growth in a, in a short period of time. And when I moved back, I started just paying attention and there were things that were happening that the residents were really upset about some mismanagement, some poor choices, some, charges to the residents as far as water rates. And it was just the whole thing, right? The city was being sued. And so I started going to meetings and started listening. And I heard one of the council members make a comment that, again, just like shot me upside the head. And I thought to myself, that is not how this is supposed to be. Elected officials are working for we the people You may not always agree. You may not always be able to solve everybody's problem, but you need to at least listen and have compassion and make the right choices for for everybody. And so I was just like, again, I had that fire. I'm like, okay, something has to be done here. And this was in 2016. Election season was coming up. There was a few seats open and they did a candidates workshop. The county always does a candidates workshop at the start of every season. And it was happened to be held at Lincoln City Council or excuse me, Lincoln City Hall. And so I went to this workshop. My husband goes, go find out. I went. They give you a big binder of all this information. This is what you need to do if you want to run for office. And I walked out of there and I said, I'm running. He goes, all right, let's do it. And so in 2016, I didn't know anything. Like yeah. I, I had never run for office. I didn't know anything. But God is good because he put people in my path. He introduced me to people. You know, had People introduced me that really gave me a footing, helped me get started. And in that election... It was really just me and my husband and Jesus. I didn't have anybody else really helping. I raised a little bit of money and I was able to get my name out there, but I participated in forums. I participated in debates. I knocked on doors. I You talked about pounding signs. I pounded signs. We did all of that, right? And right before that election, right the last weekend, my husband had to have open heart surgery, uh, emergency, um, wow. yeah, triple bypass. And so the campaign, everything just stopped. Like nothing else mm-hmm. was important. And there were some other things that played into it. You wouldn't think that small town politics would be dirty, but in a lot of ways it is sometimes. And there were, there were things that happened that I questioned. And I'm just like, that seems a little shady. But I was running against three incumbents, a gentleman who was on the planning commission who had great name recognition. There was me and another woman who didn't campaign at all. And it was really weird that she was running because she didn't do anything. But... <laughs> Yeah. And so I didn't win, but my numbers were really good for never having done it before. And so people said, you did good. Keep, keep going. And so I didn't win, but one of the messages that I try to tell people is if something means something to you, keep at it. Because a lot of times people run for office and it takes more than once to get elected. If you really care about it, if you really want it, keep working at it. Sometimes yeah. people get mad about something. I'm going to run for council, and then they lose, and then you never hear from them again. Let's wait for it. Can I ask you a question? Yes. You go from 
you said, you know, in high school, I wasn't confident enough to try mm-hmm. out for the sports team, right? And um, I'm sure middle school, teaching middle school really probably gave you some thick skin. But yes. you go from, like, politics is, I'll be very honest, it's very overwhelming. Like, what's right? What's wrong? Mm-hmm. Who's who? What's the agenda? Like, it's massive. And even what's going on in your town, even at, you know, 5,000 people to 50,000, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. So um, how, like, what, it seemed, faith, obviously, guiding light in there, but it's just such a massive shift and to literally just say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and run for office. Like Mm -hmm. that's like, what in it, in you, do you think allowed you to do that? That's a good question. I would say I'll go back to the armor that God was building because Mm -hmm. there was a lot of things that happened from those early years. And when I first thought about running to when that happened and just as a side note, you know, I did not run for office and go back to grad school and all of that until I was 50 years old. My youngest was wow. in high school and the other kids were grown and out. And so that would be another message that it's never too late to start something it's new. It's never too late. It's oh, never too I late. And so I, I, so here's another side note. This is why I'm so insane is that I launched my campaign. Um, well, actually, that was my second one. So I didn't win in 2016. I stayed engaged. I um, went to all the council meetings I, I learned a lot. And then in 2018, I ran again and I won. And so what I was going to say is in 2018, I turned 50. I started grad school. I went back to school. My, I, um, the summer was over, so I had to go back to work. I was still teaching full time. Right. Mm-hmm. And then my dad was dying all at the same mm-hmm. time. And so for a few weeks, for a few months there, my life was insane. I'm told my husband, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> But it was an, it was an adventure, right? And yeah. so, so to your, answer your question, yeah, I went through a major transformation from my twenties and thirties, and even early forties, to where I was when I was fifty, or a few a few years before that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, God just prepared me. Everything. I mean, we could be here for you know a month to tell you all the stuff that <laughs> that you know life happens, right? But. Yeah. God prepared me, and I did. Teaching middle school does give you thick skin. Mm -hmm. Um, In ministry, it does help you learn how to overcome hurts and wounds and and move on in a good, positive way. And so by the time I got there, I was ready. Now, I learned a lot still. I was, you know, I was... Some of the stuff was terrifying. My very first forum. I mean, I'm a public speaker. I'm a preacher. I can speak in front of students. Parent uh, teachers always get nervous and talking in front of parents. I'm like, that doesn't bother me. I can do that any day, right? You can talk in front of kids all day, but you put the parents in the room and they're like, I'm nervous. I'm like, that doesn't bother me. But when you are on a new stage with all these elected officials who've been in city government for a really long time, they know all the issues. They know all the ins and outs. And I didn't. I was still learning. I ended up doing well, but that's because I prepared and God was with me. But I remember I was terrified. And but you know what? You just got to do it scared. It's imposter syndrome. You just got to do it scared. Yeah, you just got to do it scared. I love that. Do it scared. So I want to tell you, you know, give you a compliment. You're incredibly humble and like your your faith absolutely plays a role in in your life. Um, But faith plays a role in a lot of people's lives and they make decisions and they don't go down the path that you went down. So there's something about you that when something is thrown at you and you run into a challenge, you figure out to take the positive side and faith. Absolutely. They're not taking anything away from you. No, of course, of course they're they're, Um, I can see it in you in that, Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to get this done Uh, two years after you lose an election. You're like, I'm coming, I'm going to go put the effort in and you put the work in to yeah. get to where you want it to be. And then you're going to grad school at 50. Yeah. Um, so um, <laughs> there is something about your work ethic and in your personality. Yeah. Again, not to take anything away from the faith, but of there's course. a you factor yeah. um, that I'm catching on to. Um, so I know um, we're, we're at about 45 minutes. So I want to make sure I get in a couple of things with you. So you, cause I want to get to what you're doing at Jessup. Absolutely. Um, but I also want to talk about real quick. So you run, you, you get elected um, in 2018. Joyous? Oh, yeah. It was amazing. It was surreal. It was fun. It was awesome. <laughs> and But then even then, you know, so I get on the council and many of the council members that were there, some were not there, some still are, they really didn't know what to make of me and they didn't support me. And when I first came on, mm. they they weren't very welcoming I would say right there was one in particular who was very condescending all the time and I had a choice to make 
I can come on here with a chip on my shoulder and, you know, give attitude all the time because they're being jerks, right? Or I could do the job that I was elected to do. And so what I did was I did a good job and I earned their respect. And to this day, they're all my really good friends. We love each other dearly. We don't always agree, right? Which is good. You don't always want to agree. You've got to have healthy debate. But I earned their respect because I was professional, because I was honest, and I am very passionate. I've had people, you know, use the word, well, Holly, you just can't be emotional about it. I'm like, stop saying that I'm emotional. Because when you say that, it makes it sound like I'm not thinking things through and I'm not being logical. I'm very passionate about what I believe and what I think is right. And I'm going to tell you about it. Right. So I came on and I earned their respect. And and to your point, yes, faith builds me who I am. Everything I try to do, I try to glorify God. But I think a lot of who I am comes from being the firstborn, having that responsibility placed on my shoulders at a young age. I'm very conscientious. I work hard. Working for my grandfather and his trucking company and then working for my father, it was, you do it right. You're If you're 10 minutes um, early you're late like you need to be hmm. where you're going on time I can relate <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes. and and so you know washing cars no you missed a spot go back and do it you know cleaning bathrooms like even today in in my you know leader when I was mayor people would be like oh my gosh you're the mayor what do I call you like you can call me Holly I'm just a person <laughs> you know even in these these roles that people look up to I'm still at the church cleaning toilets and vacuuming rugs and just doing whatever needs to be done and I don't say that in a bragging way I look at it as servant leadership right and that's those things were instilled in me from my parents and my grandparents growing up work ethic, all of that. Yeah, so. they're incredible qualities. Mm-hmm. So uh, before we trans over to, yep. transfer over to William Jessup, yep. um, so the the biggest opportunity in Lincoln from where you're sitting in your seat that you can influence, what is it? that? What's the agenda item that you would say you wanted to talk about or you think is important to that community that you're, you're championing? Well, right now we are really working hard to attract more commercial. Lincoln is a great place to live. They're building houses like crazy, but you know, we can't keep doing that forever. We are a great place to come do business. There are people there that want to shop in our community. We need to keep our tax base in Lincoln. We have a lot of tax tax leakage to Roseville and Rockland, and we need we're working hard to keep it in our town so we can fund our police and fire. The other thing is our we have an airport and it's a great airport, but it, it needs more hangers. I didn't even know you had an airport. I didn't know. <laughs> I just said it. I was like, oh no, I'm the only one. No, it's been there. It's been there since like World War II era. Um, and it's a great airport. It's a great asset. And so we're working hard to build up that asset to make it a the gem of Placer County that oh it can gosh, be. Yeah. So that's a big priority. And, and so for those two priorities, for those that are listening, how can they support? How can they help? How can they get involved? They could shop in Lincoln. Shop in Lincoln. Yeah, shop in Lincoln. And bring come, your business. Bring Lincoln. your business. Come come to our town. We got a lot of great businesses, a lot of great um, mom and pop shops and restaurants. And great, rec- fantastic restaurants. We yeah. have great restaurants, great breakfast place places. Yeah, there, there's a lot. All Lincoln, right, give us our, a restaurant. Or can you give one or are you going to alienate some? Give can, us a couple. I can give you several for breakfast. Uh, yeah. Simple Pleasures is great for breakfast and lunch. We got the Waffle Shop. We got the Waffle Farm. Uh, if you want to go to a high-end restaurant for lunch or dinner, Buonarotti's, right there on Lincoln Boulevard. Uh, Chef Daniel is from Italy. He's amazing. Oh. Uh, wow. If you want a Mexican, Casa Ramos is good. Yeah. Uh, Lincoln Chinese is great. It's one of my favorite places. Uh, we have all kinds of great places. Uh, Old Town Pizza is oh, amazing. Old Town, Old Town, Town Pizza. Yeah. 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 And well, I'm sorry to all my Lincoln friends if I forgot your restaurant. There's <laughs> many of them. Yeah. We'll have them on the podcast, actually, so you can put a word out. There you and, go. You know, we'll, you go. And we'll be happy to promote. So yeah. tell us what you're doing today with William Jessup. So what I'm doing today is really kind of a culmination of leaving public education because I, re- what's, I talked about the struggle of our students. What Jessup does is really amazing. Jessup offers Christ-centered, excellent education. It's not a, what we call a traditional Bible school. There are many paths. There's nursing program. There's digital media. There's theater. There's all, you know, political science, uh, public policy is what we call it. There's all kinds of paths, but it's Christ-centered. It's excellent education, and it's a place for students to come get a, a top-quality education in a very encouraging and healthy environment, 
right? You're going to have conversations with your professors and your fellow students and explore the issues of life, but you're not going to get indoctrinated with all kinds of garbage that your parents, you know, parents send their kids to school, our university system today. And I don't, I don't mean to be degrading, but a lot of our top universities are turning out kids who hate America. They're turning out kids who are lost or young adults by that point, right? William Jessup wants to bring them in, love them, give them a great education, and send them out to be world changers. And as Dr. Jackson, the president, always says that our Jessup students are exceptionally employable. Mm. And we have a high percentage of students who leave Jessup and they already have jobs. And so my job, what I'm doing is I'm in the advancement department. Okay. Which is cultivating relationships with people who care about the vision and mission of Jessup and want to want to donate. So I'm a fundraiser. That's like the basic way to put it. But it's not just about calling people and saying, hey, will you give to the school? It's about cultivating relationships with people who care about the school, who are connected to the school in some way. Either their student went there, their child, or they have friends, or they just know about it from a different way. What are you excited about? What do you what do you want to give to? Some people really are impassioned about our new nursing program. We launched our nursing program program last, this last year. It's amazing. If you guys want to come to lunch, I'll host you for lunch. I'll give you a tour. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, we fun. have yeah, we have an aviation program now where uh, they are, have a classroom and and simulators in Oh, really? uh, in the classroom and on campus. And then they uh, do classrooms at Lincoln Airport. And then they right now they're flying out of Auburn, but we're trying to get them all oh where they're gosh, flying out of Lincoln. Wow. So <clears throat> what would, oh, go ahead. Go I ahead. was just going to finish saying, so, so there's, we have a great theater program. So there's, there's obviously needs. Any university has needs. So when I really form relationship with donors, what do you care about? What mm-hmm. interests you? And let, let me help you fulfill your philanthropic desires through something that you want to give to. Yeah. So I was going to ask a question might not be a fair question because I was going to say, what's the biggest need, but it sounds as you're working with the donors, you're really finding out where they want. Yeah. Well, I would say that the biggest need overall is what we call the Jessup fund. And it's the unrestricted fund that goes to scholarships for kids based Mm -hmm. on needs. Really. we, We give millions of dollars every year to scholarships for kids so they can afford to go there. But every department has needs, right? Like we would love to have an airplane, our own airplane for the aviation department. Right now we we contract with a company where we rent their planes and the students practice on those. We'd love Mm -hmm. to have a couple of our own. We'd like to have our own fleet, right? We have a great theater department, but right now... They perform in the warehouse where chapel is and where all the meeting, big meetings are. We really need a performing arts center. Right? Mm-hmm. Our nursing program, we spent about $2 million launching that, but they need more mannequins and more equipment. So there's always needs for that. Our, we do have a theology department. And there are several different schools of theology there. We have one um, that's called uh, Casa Latina, which focuses on Hispanic students and Hispanic mm-hmm. churches. We have a new program. It's newer called the on-ramp to uh, for foster youth, uh, former foster youth, give them scholarships and help them get into school. Because, you know, in the foster system, once you're 18, you're out of the system. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And so we have scholarships for, for them um, to help get them plugged in get them involved in school there's many different programs like that my sister actually she goes to William Jessup and yes. she's um uh criminal justice so yeah. it's very it's been a different experience for yeah. her um we obviously grew up in uh you know church on Sunday but yeah. in uh public school and so now she's like yeah I'm taking my bible class she started telling me mm-hmm. like oh my bible class right like you have one or two per uh semester so she's loving it she's close to graduating and it's been a um, it's just, there's so much to offer there. I've been hearing about it through her. So it's really mm-hmm. cool that yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Our public policy and criminal justice department are great. Yeah. The students that come out of there, they're brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And so where does this passion come from for you, for, for the students, the donors, William Jessup, you know, giving back in your community, all, just all around where like, you have um, a motor for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think the passion comes from, from a couple of different places. My passion for education, because even though when I was younger, I really didn't know what I wanted to do intellectually. I wasn't very confident, but I think God just designed me to be a teacher, to be an educator. And that's really at the core of who I am. So I have a passion for education. I have a passion for higher education and I have a passion for Christ center. I went to a Bible college myself and I really believe in it. It's not for everybody, right? And like I said, Jessup's not a Bible college, but it it is... 
it's faith based and that is really needed and really important. And so my passion for education, my, my passion for our young people, especially coming out of COVID with all the issues we talked about, I care about their mental health, their well being, being, uh, productive members of society that can give back. We have just some students are changing the world. Right. Mm-hmm. And then just, you know, being a mom and I have four adult children that I want to see successful in the same way. Yeah. I'm just a passionate person. I don't know. Other than, you know, just God put that in me when he, he made me. I really don't know where it comes from. I just, I've had people say things to me like, you know, you're a brawler. And I'm like, what? And they go out of me in like a bad way. Like you're not getting in bar fights or anything like that, but you're just, you know, you're just go after it. I guess I do. You I don't do, know. yeah. So. I, was thinking, I, was, I, was, I had to catch myself for a minute. I was feeling um, adequate. I was like, huh, she, no. she must not have any time in her day. <laughs> oh, like, so <laughs> when I was, in all, in all fairness, I no. did look you up before the podcast. And the amount of boards or committees that you're on, I'm like, I honestly don't know how it's possible in one day. There's like 15 listed, and I'm yeah. like, and teaching. And I was like, that is absolutely insane. Well, so it is a little bit impressive. In, well, it's thank you. Impressive. When I was teaching full time, I did things in the morning and the afternoon. I couldn't do the board things during the day right but then when I stepped away from that and I had that year off I was able to take on some more things and I'm really fortunate because uh, when I was hired onto Jessup I came on part-time and then just right shortly they, they made me full-time and what what I'm really fortunate and blessed is that Dr. Jackson really values the the intersectionality between my government job my city council community service and my job at Jessup because there's a lot of overlap like for instance I am fundraising for the aviation, the the school in general, but the aviation program is very interesting to me. And I've made some contacts with people who are donors to that. But being on the city council, the airport is one of my top priorities. And I have connections there that we are working to build new hangars and make it a better place. And one of the people that are doing that for Lincoln Airport is a donor to the aviation program. So there's a lot of crossover. Mm -hmm. And so I have a lot of connections, different places. So he, he appreciates that and understands. So I have a little bit of freedom to like go run to this board meeting and then come back to work or meet with the donor and then, which is not everybody has that. And I'm very, very blessed. Yeah. So for William Jessup, what's the word you'd like to get out? How can people help? How can, we'll put all your contact information out there, but um, if there's one thing you would say, Hey, come talk to you about what? Or what can they do? Whatever your message is. Yeah, come talk to me about the mission and vision of Jessup. Let me take you to lunch. I'll give you a tour of the campus. We can talk about the programs that interest you. And we'll find find what pas- makes you passionate, right? What what interests you. So anybody, come come to the campus. Yeah, Let me feed. And here's the thing. I don't know if you've ever been there, but the uh, Jessup Cafe is open to the public. <laughs> and it, the food is excellent. And it's very, very affordable. Good. Yeah, I haven't been to the cafe. I have spent a lot of time in that gym. Yeah, uh, because both of my boys play basketball in the area, so they end up playing tournaments. So we're gonna have to schedule you guys to come have lunch with me. We'd love to. We'd love to. to. So when you put my information, anybody's interested in finding out more about the school, some of our programs, take a tour. I'm at their service. Um, Excellent. So this has been an you have an incredible story, and I know we only scratched the surface. It's only an hour. (laughs) Uh, But any other message, whether it be about Lincoln, your family, anything that you want to share, you know, as we close out. Well, everything that I am and do is because of God, and um, I strive every day to give Him glory in what I do. So everything that I am, I give Him the praise for it. I don't take any credit. But if I was going to leave any message, it would be a couple things. It would be, and I'll reiterate, I've already said it, is that you're never too old to start something new. You're never too old to go after your dream. You're never too old to go back to school or do what makes you happy right so don't be afraid to take that leap because it is a leap of faith sometimes you don't know where it's (laughs) gonna lead but um you don't want to miss what's waiting for you on the other side and the other thing is sometimes you have to work at it like i said when i didn't win my first election a lot of people get frustrated and they get discouraged and like well it's too hard it's too much work i'm not going to do it again it was something that i really was passionate about and so keep at it if you really mean something to you you got to keep at it and then I think the last thing I would say is um, if you want to be a leader, then investigate the servant leadership model. Don't ask people to do things that you're not willing to do yourself. And and what I try to do in any role is 
bring people around me that are smarter and that are talented. And my job is to encourage them and lift them up and help them be successful because when they're successful, I'm successful. We are not in competition with each other. And your success does not diminish my potential and my potential or my success does not diminish your potential. There's enough sunlight for everybody. So we're not in competition with each other. I try to try to lift people up and help them be successful. And that's what we should do for each other. Absolutely love it. Um, so do you happen to have a leadership course that you teach? Because you sound like, I've been to a couple of them. Um, seriously, do you, do you? I don't have a course okay. that I teach, but um, <laughs> I've just learned a lot over the last several years. Um, yes. Really, really good advice. So thank you so much for oh taking my gosh, the time. Thanks for and, having me. Yes. It's an honor. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. It has been um story and the conversation absolutely inspiring you are 100 percent a light i love Aww, to we talk about you. people being a light and being around it so um extremely grateful that you sat with us oh today. thank you that's that's very sweet thank you it's my honor to be here